Well, shape and construction of a hypersonic flight vehicle is driven very much on what its mission is, how fast it'll be flying and how far up in the atmosphere it'll be flying. And there are several primary considerations and issues which have to be addressed to design the flight vehicle. I've listed some of them here. The one I'm going to talk about today is heat transfer primarily. You're moving very fast in a high-speed flight and that's the real difficult thing to ha handle, the fact that you've got air sliding past you very quickly and heating the vehicle up. Well, we'll look at some simple heat transfer relationships in order to get some intuitive feel for what we've got to do about the shape of our vehicle. Well, one thing is if you're looking at stagnation flows or near the front of blunt bodies like we have here, for, for blunt body flows, the heat transfer scales with the square root of the density times the velocity cubed divided by a square root of the radius. Well, one thing we know is that velocities are going to be big, so this uh, u cubed term here might be an issue. And also, if we have small dimensions, sharp leading edges, they're going to be very difficult to handle too. So, it, to, to manage the heat transfer, we've got to really not have things too sharp, because they're going, when this R goes to zero, we're going to melt everything. That's for a, a piece of the flow near the front of a body. Now, we're going further down a surface, like on, say, the wing of a shuttle when you're away from the leading edge, there's a similar relationship develops, which is the velocity scales with the square root of the density times the velocity cubed, divided by a square root of a different dimension, divided this time by the square root of the distance away from the nose. So this again points to the fact that noses, leading edges, are going to be very difficult to handle, because you like to make them sharp to reduce drag, but uh, that's going to kill you because the, you're dividing by a number near to zero on the bottom. So the critical parts of the design will be protecting the leading edges of your vehicle and the bits close to the leading edges. So both of the formulations for near the nose and away from the nose have the same generic shape. The heat transfer is scaling with a square root of density times the velocity cubed term. So with a designer, you'll, you'll know what your maximum loads have to be, and you'll design for that. And when you reach that limit, uh, you're in trouble. So if this is, we say this is equal to a constant for the moment, which is equal to your design value, doesn't matter too much if you're flying with less heat transfer than you planned for, except it'll be slightly too heavy. If that's going to be a constant, you can see that um, the, the, to keep that value, density will have to, to scale with velocity to the power of minus 6 to keep that constant. In other words, if you want to, if, if you want to increase your velocity by a factor of 2, your associated heat transfer will go up by a factor of 64, 2 to the power of 6 if you're at that limit. So really what it means is when you reach a design limit and you're flying say on an accelerating flight path, like say might be prescribed by a scramjet, the game's over when you reach that limit, you've just got to get out of the atmosphere as soon as you can. Another issue to consider is if it is an accelerating flight path, you're likely to have say a scramjet flight path, your rho u squared, which is proportional to your dynamic pressure, is a constant. So call that some value c. That means your density has to be scaling with a constant over your velocity squared. So if you take this value of density, slip it back into that heat transfer equation, we then get the heat transfer if you're on an accelerating flight path with a constant dynamic pressure as you need for combustion. Your heat transfer is going to be scaling with the square root of c over u squared for the density times a u cubed term, which is a velocity squared. So if you double your speed, you're going to have to increase your heat transfer by a factor of four, or your, your heat transfer will increase by a factor of four. That's clearly a very difficult design challenge when you're trying to fly scramjets as fast as you can. We're plotting the parameter root rho u cubed for a constant dynamic, constant dynamic pressure flight path of 100 kilopascals. And you can see that factor here, every time you double your velocity, you have four times increase in heat transfer. A very difficult design situation to overcome. Okay, so what I just spoke about was characteristic of an accelerating uh, scramjet corridor. What about re-entry? Well, the same rule is going to apply. We're scaling with the root root rho u cubed. Obviously, out in space, before you get in, velocity is very high density is zero, so there's no heat transfer. When you land, velocity, of course, 
goes to zero and density is high, so it goes to zero again. So you might expect a, a heat transfer profile looking something like that if this was against your velocity. And we know this function for ballistic reentry because of uh, equations we developed in the previous lecture. So this is a relationship we are familiar with for a ballistic reentry where it's the vehicle characteristics and the reentry angle are defined. So what we'd like to do now is extend this relationship to work out how our heat transfer is going to depend on reentry. So it's a very simple expression. We take the root density out the front, multiply it by that factor. And actually, I haven't put in any usable coefficients yet, so this is actually a proportional to, not an equals sign there in that form of the equation. Well, it's a simple, a simple exercise to differentiate that and find out where it has its maximum value. And you see it occurs as shown here. It goes as a, you get maximum heating at a higher altitude than you get your maximum forces because of the extra velocity coupling to it. And in fact, you get your highest heat transfer at approximately 0.85 times your entry velocity. This, of course, is only for situations where convecting heating is important, not radiative heating. As an example, we can look at the Hayabusa reentry profile, the Japanese mission to the Japanese sample return mission, came back in 2010, and you see the I'm normalized the heat transfer here by the maximum value, which for this case turned out to be at about 10 kilometers per second. And you can see it's within an order of magnitude of that for quite a long part of the flight vehicle, you know, from here to here. Uh, that, that whole part of the flight range is very high levels of heating rate. So that's an indication that this is going to be a very big problem to deal with for re-entry craft. Well, to make use of these, we have to put real numbers in, and we're going to look at some ways of getting that from, from the flow characteristics of the vehicle. Well, the first thing is, what does uh, heat transfer depend on? Well, we know it goes with the temperature gradient at the wall. It's the conductivity times the temperature gradient at the wall. Looking at heat transfer, we know that the heat transfer is equal to the conductivity times the dt dy at the wall. Looking at shear stress, we know the shear stress is equal to the viscosity times du du dy at the wall. Very similar relationships. And what we want to find is a way of approximating these. Well, one thing we can say is the uh, velocity gradient is approximately equal to the velocity change divided by the distance over which it takes place, which is the boundary layer thickness delta. Similarly, we can express the uh, temperature gradient as the temperature difference divided by the boundary layer thickness. Of course, in the temperature situation, what is we're interested in isn't really the static temperature outside the boundary layer. That might be quite low. It's the recovery temperature, which is a characteristic temperature of the uh, boundary layer. And in fact, if you look at the temperature profiles at the wall, if you let your wall get hot enough, you can remove the heat transfer. And the temperature we're going to use is what we call the adiabatic wall temperature, which is a temperature which just brings the heat transfer to zero. It's a very, very similar to the total temperature of the flow. And so we'll look at that temperature change taking place from, and that's what's affecting the temperature gradient here at the wall for a, a cooled boundary layer situation. Okay, so using these formulations and these uh, proportionalities, we can deduce what's happening. Okay, so for shear stress, we're going to say shear stress is mu times u over boundary layer thickness, and we'll also express that in terms of a skin friction coefficient, where the shear stress is a skin friction coefficient times a half for a u squared, the dynamic pressure. Okay, working on these two formulations, you can see there's a very big similarity between heat transfer and skin friction, and in fact, if you work through this, you can see we can actually write your heat transfer down as a function of your shear stress. This here is your shear stress, that's your tor. Uh, so the heat transfer is the shear stress times the velocity times another a collection of coefficients. So if you look at these things here, that K of a mu CP, that's actually your Prandtl number, and for hot air, that's a number pretty close to 1, 0 0.8, 0 0.72, things like that. So for our purposes, we'll ignore it and make it equal to 1, which is uh, brings us to this very simple formulation then, that the heat transfer is your shear stress times your velocity over 2, so we're forgetting that fella, and this is a well-known Reynolds analogy, by the way. Uh, so now we can express our heat transfer in terms of a skin friction coefficient, which we may be able to calculate. 
So if we're using the big Q to represent the total heat transferred to the vehicle during the re-entry mission, we can express that as the integral over time of your local heating rate over the whole surface of the body uh, to get the relationship you see on the top. In the top equation we have our heating rate as a function of time and we want to transfer that to a function of distance to make it easier to get the total heat out you're going to incur during the journey. The coupling between time and distance of course is just given very simply between your local velocity and the angle you have uh, with the horizontal and it can be expressed as uh, the dy is the u sine theta times d dt. So we can now uh, formulate our equations into a form against y. So what I'm doing here is replacing the local form of the heat transfer coefficient in the top equation with an average value integrated over the body in the line below. And the value we're using is effectively given by this integral here, which is something you need a lot of information about the body to calculate and normally be done numerically or through some experiments, of course. So if we have a vehicle that's making some sort of a re-entry trajectory, we need to know the local heat transfer at every point on the vehicle and we relate that to, to a function of your local shear stress and uh, we need to know that at each point in the flight trajectory. We'll make advantage here of the Mach number independence Mach number independence means that really this frictional coefficient is not going to be very, a very strong function of Mach number, and so we'll approximate it by a constant value. We use a constant value for the whole trip. That's going to be a useful approximation to make. You just have to be a little bit careful here though, but if you're looking at regions where transition to turbulence is taking place, that is a strong function of Reynolds number or altitude, and uh, you, there may be areas where this approximation is not safe to make, but for the moment we'll make it. So we can express dq by dy by the relationship on the top, and it's something we can integrate quite well, so we integrate it and we get the expression you see here. Now if you examine this equation, you will see actually this term here is the velocity. Velocity squared, in fact. We give that term as the velocity, and we're assuming at the end of your trip your velocity has dropped to zero. Of course it doesn't have to, you could do a partial entry and stop at some point in time. So we can simplify this equation just by expressing it as a coefficient on the left here times the change in velocity squared. And that's the total heat you absorb during re-entry. Obviously a very important design parameter to have your handle on. Another way of rewriting that is to note that the change in U squared over 2 is the total kinetic energy you lose. So we can say the energy you absorb on re-entry, this Q, is equal to the total energy you, you're dumping through your braking process times this parameter on the top, on the right. So this is uh, repeating what we had already, already empirically concluded that if you want to have an efficient heat shield you make it a blunt body so most of your energy gets transferred to the gas not your surface and you make your skin friction coefficients very small so there's a minimum amount of viscous heating. You'd also want to minimize your exposed surface area to the flow and maximize your projected area to the flow because that tells you how much air you're pushing out of the way to do your slowing down. So this is a very useful starting point for estimating how much heat your heat shield will have to reject or absorb. I'll now go for an example of uh, using these relationships for the Apollo return mission. A few well-known properties, the velocity was 11,200 meters per second, diameter of the capsule 3.9 meters, the mass was, was 585800 approximately kilograms, mass of a heat shield, the order of 848 kilograms. I'm taking a value of uh, mean friction coefficient at 0.04, uh, something of a guess. Uh, exposed surface area is 
30 meters squared as the external surface that's exposed to the flow. A projected area of 12 meters squared. Okay, these are our inflow conditions. We want to find out how much heat do we have to design for, for this mission. Okay, we've got to work out that parameter that goes after the E. So that was a half into your friction coefficient times your exposed surface area, drag coefficient times your area. Work that out, it becomes to 0.037. That looks pretty good. You're only losing something like 4% of the heat has to be absorbed by the vehicle. But then that's still quite a big number. Um, the total energy you have coming in from 11 kilometers per second is something like 63 megajoules per kilogram. That's kinetic energy u squared over 2. So what you're absorbing then, the Q is going to be of the order of 0.037 times that, 2.3 megajoules per kilogram. Well that sounds sort of okay. It's still actually a lot of energy. If you burn hydrogen in air, you get something like 3 megajoules per kilogram of enthalpy released. So it's something like absorbing all the energy you can get from burning hydrogen in air. It's that order of magnitude. It's much bigger than anything can order. Anything can store through sensible heat or latent heat if you're using phase change to try and cool your vehicle, for instance. Um, but actually it's even worse than that, because that is per kilogram of a whole vehicle. We're trying to dump all this through a heat shield. So if you find out how much is being rejected per kilogram of heat shield, so the Q is equal to 2.3 times 5800 over 848, which is of the order of 16 megajoules per kilogram of heat shield mass. So that's a, that's a big number. So we've got to do something about it. We've got to find a way of getting rid of it. So conventionally, we can't store that much energy. We have to throw it away. And this is one of the situations, the rare situations, where the rules of physics are actually working in our favor. So we will radiate the heat loss away. And we know of a simple formula for radiation. It's Stefan Boltzmann constant times emissivity times t to the power of 4. Increase your temperature by a small amount, you get a giant increase in the amount of heat capacity you can dump. But of course, you do have to get significantly hot to do this. we we'll give a few examples. If your temperature of the order of 2100 K, you get the heat transfer it can dump is of the order of one megawatt per meter squared. Now that's a good number actually, because that's coincidentally about the maximum heating rates they had on the space shuttle. And 2100 degrees was about how hot they could get the reinforced carbon carbon on the leading edges to survive and radiate the heat away. So you can get a sort of heat balance approach whereby your external surface gets hot and the gas gets radiated away. The surface, the shock wave, temperature of the order of 2000 K. And all the heat can be radiated away. Everything's fine. Of course, that's not the biggest numbers we have to come up with. Take uh, temperature is equal to 3500 K. You're rejecting something like 10 megawatts per meter squared. That's a significant amount of energy. But actually, you do have to get hotter than that in certain situations. Some of them we have, like going to Jupiter, you have hundreds of megawatts per square meter. The other thing is, this is not survivable temperature, not reusable. So when we're looking at these sort of temperatures here, they can control the heat, but they're sacrificial. And this is where we use ablative heat shields. If you get up to these temperatures, they also start subliming. You get direct conversion of uh, carbon solid to a uh, gaseous form of carbon in the surrounding shock layer, and that can increase your heat transfer a lot as well. And so that helps you handle the situation. In fact, you can get of the order of hundreds of megajoules per kilogram heat rejection through this technique. 
and that's why the external surfaces of all high-speed re-entry vehicles are built as ablators. So that's a situation how we can control the heat load for where we are able to radiate the heat away. Of course, you can't do that if you have ducted flows. If you take, say, a scramjet, imagine a scramjet like this, with its shock compression and everything, the heat transfer levels can get very high in a scramjet. It can get up to sort of 10 megawatts per meter squared, very high levels of heating. But of course, there's no radiation path for removing the gas, because you radiate it, it just falls to the other side of the duct. You're not actually getting it out. So we have to, and this is one of the primary challenges of getting scramjets to work. How do you control the heating loads? We're using tricks like regenerative cooling, where we're using the latent heat of the fuel that's being supplied to make the scramjet work as a coolant. This may work up to num flight speeds of the order of Mach 10. But above flights of Mach 10, it's going to be harder to reject the heat in a scramjet. The scramjet has got to try and create nice clean shocks at the intake, so there's going to be very sharp leading edges. If you make them too blunt, you can get too much drag, separate flow. Uh, but the advantage of the leading edge is actually they can see outside to a certain amount. So we'll probably use a bit of radiative cooling. To try and protect the leading edges of scramjets. But it is one of the major technical challenges we have in trying to get scramjets to work. Managing the fuel load, along with all the other difficulties that there are as well. So I'll conclude this section by saying we've developed an approximate model that enables us to estimate the total heats that are, are likely to be encountered on a re-entry trajectory and come up with a configuration that will give you an engineering solution to re-entry, which we know we've been doing that for 60 years or so, and indicating that it's a primary source of engineering difficulty for the future of scramjet propulsion.